this is Where Have All the Natives Gone? Funding Community Archaeology and Understanding Everyday Life in Raymond Cumbria by Jennifer Peacock, who's at the University of Worcester. Within the tours and pamphlets and, dis and discourses of encountering Hadrian's Wall, the visitor has moral duties. A visitor to the wall, visitors to the wall are encouraged to evoke a dream of Roman rule and to engage with a particular sensibility of the civilized world of Roman rule. This is from a recent AHRC project titled Tales, Tales of the Frontier. This includes the following generalized narrative. The Roman army arrives in a wild, untamed landscape at the end of the first century AD. They establish forts. They construct Hadrian's Wall. Cumbria finally becomes part of the Roman Empire. The implication is that there is a straightforward evolution from native to Roman. Over the last 15 years, museums and visitor centers in the Hadrian's Wall region have increasingly emphasized the diverse geographical origins of the Roman soldiers represented on the wall. Yet despite the fact that they may have represented 80 or more percent of the total population, <coughs> the native plays at best a supporting role, serving as an uncomplicated background against which to discuss the activities of the Romans and at worst is overlooked entirely. I am interested in this because many research frameworks have highlighted the importance of better understanding the native population. In 2000, Brees and Dobson wrote that the story of Hadrian's Wall will never be complete until it can be set in the context of the peoples it controlled and divided. In 2006, the Northeast Regional Research Framework NERRF, asked, to what extent was the economy of native communities influenced by Roman invasion and control? Did indigenous communities continue to farm and carry out industry in a native manner, or did they change their ways under Roman influence? What impact did the environment in native society have upon the deposition of Roman military forces during the conquest? How did native peoples react to Roman soldiers, and vice versa? In 2009, the Hadrian's Wall Research Framework, HWRF, wrote that, more detailed investigation of the indigenous Romano-British style of settlement is urgently required. Given the repeated indications of an east-west divide in pre-Roman activity, any, repre any representative project would need to target sites in both regions and would be an enormous undertaking. It is 2015 and these issues have still yet to be redressed. Why is this? The first step to answering this question is to what sites have been excavated. I created these two distribution maps using data from the Cumbria and Lake District HERs. We can compare this to a distribution map of excavated sites. A number of researchers have highlighted the role played by legislation, such as PPG 16, in expanding our understanding about everyday life in Roman Britain. This can be seen in a map recently created, but created by the recently completed Rural Settlement of Roman Britain. Or, excuse me. Rural Settlement, a Roman Britain project which, I was relieved to see, mirrors the results of my own research. All of these maps indicate a concentration of excavation in low-lying parts of Cumbria, and in particular in association with contemporary population centers such as Carlisle and along the length of Hadrian's Wall. At the same time, it is interesting to note that there has been very little excavation of any kind within the boundaries of the Lake District National Park. The 2009 Hadrian's Wall Research Framework HWRF noted that understanding of extramural settlements has been identified as a serious gap in existing knowledge and there is both a need and appetite for a major project or projects to address some of the key questions relating to these developments. Correspondingly, over the last five years there have been excavations of Viki, settlements outside forts at Maryport, Ravenglass, and Papcastle, which are similar in scope to those taking place in the Northeast for example at Vindolanda and Arbea, and beyond Hadrian's Wall at Binchester. But why the focus on Viki and not native farmsteads? The rest of this paper will consider one possible reason for this, the requirements of funding bodies. Before I go on, I would like to emphasize that this discussion is speculative. It is not my intention to criticize funding bodies or the projects that I will discuss. I have just found myself wondering why there has been a recent flurry of Vika's projects in Cumbria, despite the fact that archaeologists have, for more than 15 years, been emphasizing the importance of better understanding the native population. The Northwest Regional Research Strategy noted that, following the introduction of PPG 16 in 1990, the growth and development related archaeological work was matched by a downturn in non development related or research excavations. 
Only four years later, the Heritage Lottery Fund, HLF, was established and, since then, it has made more than 13,700 grants and commercial, oh, and completed nearly 2.5 billion to heritage projects of all kinds. In 2010, in a 2010 study by the Council for British Archaeology, noted that from 2000 to 2006, the Local Heritage Initiative, which is part of the Heritage Lottery Fund, funded projects across the UK. 166 were classified as archaeological, highlighting concerns at the final reports, which are required, tend to emphasize the community engagement and participant experience and not the archaeological results. It is also recorded, it also recorded accusations of tokenism with local communities involved in projects only because the sponsoring body required it. This can be as much a problem for the volunteers as the archaeological results. All of the recent Vicus projects in Cumbria emphasize the importance of community engagement and or involvement in their aims. The website for the project at Ravenglass, for example, states that the local community is keen to learn more about this site, while one of the primary goals at Papcastle is to engage the local community. The same project also writes that it aims to contribute to the archaeological knowledge by linking the Northwest Research Framework, which indicates a need for further research into the, into the development of civilian settlements associated with Roman forts. At Mariport, the aims are to develop a major heritage attraction in the area, but also the process of excavation to demonstrate the archaeological and historical significance of the site and generate support for the project amongst local people. This section will explore the following question, why this emphasis on the community? Firstly, it is important to be aware that community archaeology is a general label which reflects the increasing number of archaeological projects explicitly designed for or incorporating substantial community involvement and participation. While this definition is fluid, the implication is that this particular type of archaeology is concerned with empowering the community within which fieldwork is taking place. It serves to open up dialogues between the archaeologists, who are the minority, and the communities they work within, the majority, to enable to, enable to create, to create more, oh, wait, to enable the creation of more culturally relevant interpretations of the present, in the past. All right, hold on, got some errors here. Okay, to enable to create, to enable the creation of more culturally relevant interpretations of the past, and at least in part to relinquish control of a project to the local community. Phew. Okay, critical, academic, critically academic discourse surrounding this issue emerged and is ongoing in parts of the world where there are post-colonial indigenous rights debates. But the situation is quite different in Cumbria. Here, the archaeologists running projects at Mariport, Ravenglass, and Papcastle are not engaging with descendants and those who can or choose to trace descent from the people who once lived at or near the site, but instead, people who live locally, either on or close to a site, whose communities are defined in the present. Moreover, it is important to note that this community is not a fixed monumental entity. Not everyone living in proximity to the Vicus at Mariport, for example, will be interested in the ongoing research project. Of the people who are, some might be solely because of the employment opportunities which would emerge if a heritage attraction was developed, while others might be excited to visit or indeed participate in an archaeological excavation. Archaeology is often viewed as synonymous with excavation, and when asked, the public tends to associate the discipline with digging stuff up. It has been noted that excavation is at the heart of the popular public image of archaeology, and it is through the marketing of this hook to gain and mention interest in projects and heritage in general <coughs> that digging remains so important to the community archaeology. Many of the most memorable experiences in archaeology excavating ancient remains, discovering treasures, rescuing sites, and investigating our origins with the help of modern technology are exceptional, and to many, discovery is seen as being central to the discipline. Similarly, there is a tendency to relate discovery to the recovery of finds, and it can be argued this has become tied up with the issue of what is, and by extension what is not, valuable. The particular problem is that many of these ideas are perpetuated by what is presented to the general public, as opposed to amateur practitioners in the media. For example, it has been stated that almost all media reports on archaeological finds or discoveries are required to include some information about value. The idea that something may be old, interesting, and worthless is not acceptable. An answer will be expected not only for a golden torque or coin find, 
but for polished stone axes, beakers, or fragments of wall-painted plaster. If the excavator replies that in all honesty he or she has no idea of how much it is worth, then it will probably be reported as priceless. <laughs> Exceptional sights and finds attract attention. In 2010, it was noted that in order to address the public perception that no research was taking place in relation to Hadrian's Wall, the only exception was Vindolanda, we have to dispel the belief that archaeology equals excavation. Whether or not this can be achieved is debatable. The fact is that one of the reasons archaeology appeals to the general public is because of its drama. A recent paper concerned with community archaeology in the UK and the US, for example, concluded that the majority of participants in the projects and the projects studied wanted to visually experience an excavation in order to be entertained rather than be educated. The same study also noted that except for amateur archaeologists, who it is important to note are often highly skilled, most involved in the excavation process described the experience as boring, tedious, and tiring, which is very different from the preconceived per perceptions of archaeology as exciting and as, fa as exciting and fast-paced as portrayed on a popular television program like Time Team, arguing that this reduced any desire to dig in the future. These observations imply that the general public is more interested in seeing archaeology than doing it. If having a good day out is most important to visitors, then it seems likely that, if the opportunity to see an excavation arose, it would be more likely they would select a Fort Vicus over a farmstead. An excavation taking place at a Fort or Vicus would produce large quantities of artifacts, some of high, some of high quality or value, and tangible structural evidence, and in many cases the site would be easy to access, well maintained, provide at least some amenities. The question is, to what extent has this influenced the creation and implementation of archaeological projects in Cumbria? As noted earlier, the Northwest Regional Research Strategy, NWRRS, observed that after the introduction of PPG-16 in 1990, a growth in development-related archaeological work was matched by a downturn in non-development-related or research ex ex excavations. Similarly, most of the pre-development excavation in Cumbria has taken place in lowland areas in close proximity to contemporary population centers, and the fact that many are close to forts or viki has argu arguably helped to perpetuate the bias towards the invader. This is compounded by the nature of community archaeology in the region. It has been argued, for example, that by working with volunteers, projects are able to access funding which is not available to commercial companies. In fact, all projects are likely to be applying to the same limited number of sources, which are intended to inform management and con conservation strategies linked to presentation, education, and community issues. Tourism is at the heart of the economy in Cumbria, and it has helped to perpetuate certain interpretations of Hadrian's Wall. It also may have played a role in the projects which receive funding if we assume, for example, that the general public is more likely to be interested in viewing an excavation taking place at a Fort of Vicus than a farmstead settlement, then the former might be seen as a more valuable experience, no, more valuable enterprise, sorry. In this context, community archaeology is less concerned with achieving a broader base and multivocal past, and therefore perhaps as more in common with public archaeology, which argues that the practice of archaeology should be done for the benefit of the public. Interestingly, one researcher has suggested that community archaeology developed out of public archaeology, and that with a change in political climate, the term public was replaced with the more politically appealing and governmentally friendly, all-encompassing buzzword community archaeology. It is unclear whether this has influenced the creation of projects at Mariport, Pap Castle, and Ravenglass, but it is interesting to note that the research questions we asked are increasingly formed in part by requirements from various, pro from various research councils enforcing pr political strategies, which is making part of archaeological research. Wait. Okay which is part of making archaeology relevant to the society at large. The Heritage Lottery Fund, HLF, for example, has placed particular emphasis on the way that archaeological projects can, can provide an opportunity for local communities to learn new skills and engage with their heritage. Yet the danger of excavation, which is undertaken under the guise of, under the guise of a community project, is that it can struggle to serve the public and archaeologists simultaneously, which results in one group's value overshadowing another. I hope that this paper has demonstrated how, by thinking critically about the interrelationship between the HLF and archaeological research, we can avoid a situation in Cumbria in which an engagement is deemed more important than understanding. Thank you.